terrible myth of organized society, that everything that's done through the established system is legal, and that word has a powerful psychological impact. It makes people believe that there is an order to life and an order to a system, and that a person that goes through this order and is convicted has gotten all that is due him. And therefore, society can turn its conscience off and look to other things and other times. And that's the terrible thing about these past trials, is that they have this aura of legitimacy, this aura of legality. I suspect that better men than the world has known, and more of them, have gone to their deaths through a legal system than through all the illegalities in the history of man. Six million people in Europe during the Third Reich, legal. Sacco Vanzetti, quite legal. The Haymarket defendants, legal. The hundreds of rape trials throughout the South where black men were condemned to death, all legal. Jesus, legal. Socrates, legal. And that is the kaleidoscopic nature of what we live through here and in other places. Because all tyrants learn that it is far better to do this thing through some semblance of legality than to do it without that pretense. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos. I'm a sociologist at John Jay College here in New York. Every society, regardless of its political, cultural, or economic system, has its rules and regulations, its norms and folkways, its beliefs and customs, its mores and its laws. It couldn't function without them. When one looks at the numerous attempts to explain and define the law, invariably it boils down to the idea that it's a binding custom or practice of a community, formally recognized or enforced by some sort of supreme controlling authority and a system of courts existing to uphold, interpret, and apply it. In other words, a system of rules that are created and enforced through social or governmental institutions to regulate behavior. Controversies and questions begin to develop when we start talking about whose rules, who's enforcing them, who's being regulated, how, why, whose power is being upheld, etc., etc. Responses to the law and its systems of enforcement throughout history have been varied, provocative, and titillating. And here's only a very brief few examples. Any fool can make a rule, and any fool will mind it. Henry David Thoreau. Protest beyond the law is not a departure from democracy. It's essential to it. Howard Zinn. I've gained this by philosophy. I do without being ordered what some are constrained to do by their fear of the law. Aristotle. The illegality of cannabis is outrageous. An impediment to full utilization of a drug which helps produce a serenity and insight, sensitivity and fellowship so desperately needed in this increasingly mad and dangerous world. Carl Sagan. It may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me. And I think that's pretty important. Justice denied anywhere diminishes justice everywhere. Martin Luther King. My main problem with cops is that they do what they're told. They say, sorry, mate, I'm just doing my job all the fucking time. Banksy. First thing we do, Let's kill all the lawyers from Shakespeare. 
I shall not rest until every German sees that it is a shameful thing to be a lawyer. Adolf Hitler. Where law ends, tyranny begins. William Pitt. And the law and the life of the law has not been logic. It has been experience. Oliver Wendell Holmes. I'm enormously pleased to welcome Ron Kuby to the show today. He's a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer, erstwhile radio talk show host, television commentator, and currently leads his law office in Manhattan. He's been in the forefront of various cases and controversial struggles over the decades that reflect a variety of these philosophical, moral, and political concerns. And throughout his career, that spans powerful attempts to radically change the American legal system. While in college, he interned with the iconic William Kunstler, America's leading radical generation, uh, excuse me, a radical lawyer of his generation. They became best friends and colleagues with both men taking up the fight for the poor, the oppressed, and the downtrodden. He was involved in some of the leading and most controversial cases of our time with Kunstler, including representing Gregory Lee Johnson, a protester who burned a U.S. flag at the 1984 Republican National Convention, Sheikh Oman Abdel Rahman, the blind cleric accused of planning and encouraging terrorist attacks against Americans, Colin Ferguson, the man responsible for the 1993 Long Island Railroad shooting, Obila Shabazz, the daughter of Malcolm X, accused of plotting to murder Louis Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam, associates of the Gambino crime family, Daryl Cavey, a youth who was acquitted of assault in the Bernie Getz sling, and El Saeed Nasser, assassin of the late Rabbi Meyer Kahana. And there are numerous other cases. We just don't have the time to get into it. Perhaps even more importantly, he's also been referred to as the dude's radical lawyer. And we'll explain that a little later as we, as we meet Ron. But before we meet him in person, here's a very short clip of him in action. My name is Ron Kuby. I'm a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer here in New York City. I think it was important to be here to bear witness to Eric Gardner, to let the people of this city and this country know that we are demanding justice. We're doing it in a peaceful way. But I, I will say that, that there's been a lot of peace in New York. There has not been a lot of justice, and we hope that'll start to change. Do you, do you have anything to say about Michael Brown in Ferguson and what's happening in Ferguson? I, I, I don't, actually. Um, I, I think the Ferguson case is extraordinarily complicated as a legal matter. Uh, and so until I see more evidence, I, I really don't want to talk about it. The Gardner case, on the other hand, is very clear a legal matter. Uh, we saw on videotape a probable cause to arrest at least one police officer for at least second degree manslaughter. Thank you. Ron, welcome. <laughs> welcome, finally, you, in Jim. person, to the Radical Imagination. It's a terrific honor. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you're, you for inviting me. You're, oh, you're carrying on the mantle uh, of that radical tradition. You're trying your best, right? How did you get involved how were you radicalized? Uh, give us a... Well, you know, it, it, it's hard to really know. Mm. Uh, it would be nice if there was one point particular moment of right. before and then after. And I don't think that, that there really was. There were, I, I left home when I was very young in the early 1970s. Uh, we never had much money, and most of my friends uh, were poor or lower middle class. This was in Cleveland, right? Just, we grew up yeah, in Cleveland, Cleveland. Right. And, and I just, you know, watched the way uh, uh, the police at that time sort of systematically abused young people and hippies and others. And, and it, it was a process of, of radicalization. I, I didn't start out intending to remake American society, and <laughs> which is a good thing because it didn't work. Mm. Uh, uh, but mm. I, I, there's no one specific episode. I, I emigrated to Israel when I was very young and got deported, which mm -hmm. was a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The government paid my way out. Uh, I went to school at the University of Kansas and became involved in anti, uh, South Africa anti-apartheid activity, particularly around divestment issues, free speech issues. Uh, ended up going to law school after I got my arm broken in a demonstration by the police in Kansas. 
and uh, was privileged enough to first meet and then work with William Kunstler in 1982. I was just a young law student and mm -hmm. stayed with Bill until he died in 1995. But there must have been some influences along the way. I mean, the experiences you had, family background, uh, a teacher at some point, um, that, that aided this process of you feeling uh, an empathy with the poor, with the downtrodden, or was You know what, I, I didn't no? have to be taught that. Right. I was, was that. Experience, like Oliver Wendell. Right, you, I uh, mean, I uh, was that I person. I needed yeah. people to fucking empathize yeah. with me. Yeah, so all right. All right, so it was <laughs> okay. a personal thing. So all it right. worked out fine. All right, all right. <laughs> so you, you, you began to, to, right. to understand that at a, at a deep, profoundly personal level, and so on. Um, so, uh, we, we've got to go to the Israel thing. I mean, you immigrated, at, at least yes. the beginning. Okay, yes. all right. That, that, we'll the we'll make this as painless. The Israel thing. The, uh, well, no, you, 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 you were a follower, or your father was a follower of My, my, my father uh, was a, a convert to Judaism. Uh -huh. and, and your mother was? Uh, she was born Jewish. Jewish. And so before I was born, both my parents were Jewish. Okay. Um, so my father had the tribe. zeal of a convert. Uh -huh. uh, and okay. But, but he didn't have the religiosity uh -huh. of a convert. And, and like so many. Were you ever bar mitzvahed? No. No. Okay. I, well, me I, neither. I so stopped at blowing chauffeurs. I never <laughs> quite understood. I'm not that. going any further exactly. than that. Okay. So, so <coughs> you know, like so many. Uh, American Jews, uh, he couldn't easily wear an actual Jewish identity in the sense of he couldn't adhere to That's 613 commandments and, and, yeah. and all of that stuff that actually goes into being an observant Jew. Right. So instead, he, he channeled his undisciplined Jewiness into Zionism, which uh -huh. is, as we see, a lot of people uh, in America who define their Jewish identity by support for the State of Israel. Uh, and we see Especially happily a lot of people days. who don't. Yeah, a lot of people don't and are, right. are losing that sort of attachment perhaps as much as they may have had because of what's going on in the we, Israeli government, right? We can only hope. All right, we can only hope. We can only All right, so here so, you are. So All right. uh, he became the Midwest coordinator of the Jewish Defense League in 1970. <laughs> and, 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 and Sun Ron was at his... Uh, well, it was an interesting, Me, learning a, an interesting process because yeah. uh, Rabbi Kahana, who was the founder of the Jewish Defense League right. and its principal organizer, um, very much appealed to the sort of nationalist sentiments that were prevalent in American society at that time. For example, we had the Black Panther Party for self-defense. We had mm -hmm. the Young Lords. We had a lot of different organizations, Native so American So why not Jews as well? So right, so why not Jews? It was, he didn't sell it as a right-wing sort of neo-fascist movement. He mm -hmm. simply sold it to Jews as, as a natural extension of Jewish identity in the same way African Americans have a natural extension of, of their identity as black men and women through these radical organizations. And that's how he built it. And it was, it was pretty clever when you're talking about people who are, don't have any formal education. Yeah, young, that's a, well, working that's, class. Did he, did he feel oppressed by American society so that he would turn to that identity as a way, a vehicle to Yeah, Kahana to was, was, no, was, your was, father. Oh, no, no, my, 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 Kahana was a salesman. Right. My father was a salesman. Really? Uh, and literally? Got, yeah, literally. What did he sell? And, um, he sold everything from Zionism <laughs> to those little universities that you used to get on matchbooks. Right, mm. remember matches back yeah, when we were yeah, young? Yeah, you would yeah, open yeah. the matchbooks and get your degree from oh, Whiting from Business College. Yeah. So he sold that one? Yeah. Okay. Well, wow. So wow. That's, that was, and a little stint in Israel cured me of, of that for the most part. I see. Okay, so you went through that experience. Yeah. Yeah. You came back, and then, so uh, University of Kansas. Yeah. How did you end up there? I hitchhiked. Okay, literally. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, from, story, the, the yeah. short story of all of this is uh, I got deported from Israel. I went back to Cleveland for a couple of years. You can't leave us just at that. What were you deported from? I mean, they, you know what? The, the great thing about places like Israel, mm. which is a lot like cops, mm. they don't have to explain mm. why they're doing what they're doing. They just do it. 
And I was fine with that. I'm going to guess, like everything else that's happened to me, it was either because of something I said yeah. or my general attitude or both. Okay. So they put me on a plane, paid my way back. Had you were a, nice a gracious guest. I, I, I was uh, gracious as perhaps you could have been. In, in it was. Right. I, I learned a lot. You learned a lot. I Great. learned a lot. I okay. was anxious to teach you others know, today what I had just learned yesterday. I so, got you. Yeah. All right. So, so I came back. Came back to Cleveland, Ohio. You, uh, you, do you identify still with your Jewishness in terms of whatever your your commitment to? The, to uh, a, a radical progressive vision toward others? Is right. That, because is that I still mean, part of your identity? Remember that, that all of this was happening before the settlement movement began. Exactly. Uh, and there certainly was a way of seeing Israel that I know really harkens back to an earlier generation of, of progressives. Um, you know, in the 40s and the 50s and even 60s, there was a way of seeing Israel as a progressive, socialist, secular state. Right. Um, and a place that protected a people that had been horribly abused through the right. centuries. But, but of course, even then, that sort of avoided the Palestinian question. Agreed. And Agreed. after the settle movement, settler movement began in the 1970s, it became an impossible question to okay. avoid or, or dance around. And it just got worse and worse until you know we have the the sort of neo-apartheid that we have now. Uh, but uh, I, I remain in Cleveland. I did not go back to school, high school. Um, it was sort of a waste. Mm -hmm. uh, some friends started a, uh, an alternative high school. This was a big thing then. Right. It didn't last very long. It was, it was pretty funny, actually. The idea was to create a microcosm of the city of Cleveland, racially, culturally, economically, socially, and put all these kids together in one big melting pot. And it worked about... You actually had a building and, and yeah. teachers and Yeah, we had a building, we had teachers, we had an accreditation. And, and you fortunately then got your degree at this accredited alternative? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it didn't work very well. Um, after it worked enough to get you It folded graduated. after four and a half months after uh -huh. uh, 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 two rapes and a hostage-taking situation, and they decided to just end this before somebody actually gets killed, but they gave me a diploma. Okay. And I moved down to the Virgin Islands. I uh, worked on the tugboats in St. Croix, sure, met a woman, yeah. filed her up to Maine, um, we hung out in Maine for a while. I moved out. We moved out together to Kansas, uh, and eventually graduated from the University of Kansas. Went to Cornell Law School and uh, met Bill Kunstler in 1982, and stayed with him uh, until 1995 when he died. And we could depict a, a more interesting, more flamboyant, more uh, profound uh, mentor in a sense. Uh, no. No, um, I mean, you were just was blessed and, and very fortunate right. with that. Bill and was an authentic genius. Absolutely. Uh, he was brilliant in the courtroom. Right. Uh, there was an incredibly warm and fun side to him yeah. that most people didn't get a chance to see yeah. because, you know, they, they would predominantly see him in, in, in 30 second sound bites. Right. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And the only thing, I, I, when I look back on it, uh, what, what I the memory I, I cherish the most, I suppose, was uh, Bill and I were having um, a lunch in the village one day. There's a little French place that he used to go to down on what was it, Waverly in Greenwich or something. Okay. And we were just sitting there. It was a nice spring day outdoors, eating lunch and drinking coffee. And I realized, you know, I am so lucky. This is so fantastic. And, and this will end one day because it has to. Uh, but, but at least I'm recognizing how incredibly privileged I am to be in Bill's company, to learn from him, to work with him, and, and how much I appreciate it at the time, not just afterwards, gee, I wish I had done this before Bill died, or why didn't I appreciate that when I was younger? Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy. You appreciated the moment. I you were living in the moment. Right, and, and I That's appreciated all those moments we spent together for almost 13 years. And Give our audience an idea here about what it was like to be involved with this this incredibly radical uh, the environment that was going on at the time, and what did it mean to really be a radical lawyer back in 
the early 80s. Well, so. you know, I, I think those what are that mean, sort of two, di of the history of the law two different that? questions. Yeah. I mean, sort of what it was like to work with, with Kunstler was it was incredibly exciting and, and peripatetic. He operated his office uh, out of the basement of his house mm. in Greenwich Village. Mm. Uh, things were always going on. I mean, bombs were literally going off. 1982, uh, right. New Year's Eve, the FALN allegedly, well, it was allegedly the F FALN that did try to bomb uh, the federal courthouse and other things like that. This was the beginning of, of uh, the new New York war on crime, war on crack, a uh, tremendous amount of violent crime and scapegoating, um, a lot of police brutality. And, and at that time, there just weren't many lawyers that did that kind of work. Things have changed uh, in terms of the legal community is much broader and more diverse and deeper than it was then. Mm -hmm. But Bill Kunstler was the person people went to. Uh, yeah. uh, a lawyer of last resort, a lawyer of desperation, and, and they all sort of made their way to our door or managed to get to a phone and we would make our way down to them where they were being held. So it was this very, very, very exciting time. What it meant to, I mean, Bill was one of the lawyers that I think really created the idea of the radical lawyer. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the notion that, that your job is as a criminal defense lawyer is not to simply try to get your client off, which is the, the tools we're, we're taught in law school. Your goal uh, when you're representing political clients is to follow the client's lead, which is usually to give voice to your client's politics in the courtroom. Yeah. I mean, your client didn't do the things that he or she did in order to get off. They did them mm. to, to radically transform society. And that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, just say that again, because I think that's, that's yeah, central that to Your client didn't commit the, the, the crimes. Yeah, you weren't committing a crime. Committed. You were doing something that was just. Right. Uh, at least in their view, and, and their was, view could be was rationalized here there, necessary, necessary to, to right. radically transform society. They didn't do it with the idea of, of getting off. They knew eventually they would end up captured or dead. Uh, depending upon what the nature of the activity mm -hmm, was. Mm -hmm. And once they were in the courtroom, uh, then the trial really was an extension of their political movement. And to, to bring that movement into the courtroom, into this, this theater, if you will, right. the theater that the coercive state has constructed, and to give those politics full voice. And Bill was uh, the leading proponent of that. He was the one that mastered it. Um, it wasn't so much about the law as about justice. Is that a, a, another way of putting it? I, you know, it, or it was more about, I, I, I think, using the courtroom um, the way the client wanted the courtroom used. And, and basically using the courtroom, if you will, as an extension of the crime. And if your crime you was to burn an American flag, the courtroom is going to become an extension of flag burning. If if you are and you're calling it what it is, right? It was a crime. Sure, it was. It was a breaking of the law. Crime in the, the sense that no, that the right. so our society had, had criminalized. It. Had criminalized it. Right. Uh, it doesn't mean that that the application of the law was just or fair or uh, color neutral. It was none of those things. Right. Now. You and Bill did not necessarily, or perhaps you did, uh, agree, or did that make much of a difference with your client's position? Uh, was there a, a certain, you know, identification or, uh, if you will, love for what they were doing for well, the cause? I, I, you know, Bill how do you separate that from your, quote, you know, prof I hate to use that word, professional duty as a lawyer here? Well, Actually, that, don't that even, had, I, I didn't even No, no, that. but that had, always you become, know that had always become controversial because Bill once said he only represented people that he loved. He loved, right. And a lot of people in the, in the conservative legal community or the mainstream legal community attacked him for that. You know, well, what about all the unlovable people? You know, <laughs> they don't get lawyers? As if somehow mm -hmm. Exxon and S <laughs> Standard Oil are going to be out there. Oh, nobody loves us. We can't <laughs> find lawyers. I mean, that was they, just... They have enough lawyers, don't they? Right. That, um, <laughs> and I think over the years, <laughs> Bill sort of changed it to, to he only represented people you know, that he liked. And, and the truth is, 
And how about you? You were, you were. I, I'm sort of. I, I always. I, what's your, what I, was your I, position? I go to it the other way. I always end up liking the people I represent. Uh, one and it way grows on you. Or Not another. I see. They, they, they do, and so I it mean, becomes personal. It's, it's, it's a pragmatic. These are, are, are it, It's the person, and then by extension, the cause. Or well, look. Or both. I, I mean, doing just. Basic criminal defense work, if you're going to do it well, right. there is an intimacy that's created between lawyer and client. Mm -hmm. uh, we are their lifeline to the rest of the world. Their, li their lives are in our hands. And that creates, I mean, if you're a rational, normal human being, it creates a very powerful bond. And even people who have done terrible things, uh, and even people who have, uh, would not be considered good people, have good things about them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Nobody is the sum of their their crimes or the sum of their virtues. Right. So, so I always end up liking the people I represent. Uh, obviously, some more than others. Uh, Bill was, you know, less analytical. I mean, one of the the things about Bill that was remarkable and remains remarkable to this day, he had very very great instincts about what to get involved in and how to get involved. They weren't always right, but they were right more often, his instincts were right more often than most people's rational, calm analysis. And Which acting, is more your approach. No, not so much not, anymore. Not anymore, <laughs> but, but maybe at that point. Yeah, I would, you know, look, I was one of those more. people, I'd weigh the pros and the cons and what are the underlying politics and what are the issues here. And But, but by the time I'd finished mm, mm. that analysis, the moment to, to act had passed. Right. Okay, because because the exigencies of the circumstance didn't uh -huh. wait for me to figure out whether this is a good or bad thing to do. Bill didn't have that. Bill acted on instinct, and I followed him. Uh, well, he was more also more experienced, older at that. Time. Sure. So so you become more like that. Right. right? I mean, at like the point. Central yeah. Park uh, Five case. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Everybody thought these kids were guilty. Nobody was standing up for these kids except a, a few, very few people in the black community mm -hmm. and no one in the white community. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill thought not just they were being treated unfairly, which we could all see, but he thought that, that the charges were bullshit, as he called it as a technical sense, technical mm -hmm. word in the law. And he thought they didn't do it. And, and I wasn't so sure. Uh, but I said, okay, you know, I'm going to trust Bill's instincts on, on this rather than my own sort of f analysis. Mm -hmm. And he fought that case very, very vigorously. He did not live to see them exonerated. They mm. weren't exonerated until this millennium, uh, and he died in 1995. But but he was right, and he was right about a lot of those and things. We've had he, Abdul Salam on the oh, show. Oh, Yusuf here. Salam, sure. Yes, Yusuf in fact, Salam. he was the, the defendant that I actually wrote his appeal. Bill right. argued it in the Court of Appeals. I did, after Bill died, I did Yusuf Salam's sex offender hearing. Uh -huh. Because he gets out of prison, he's still a sex offender, and he has to be registered. I didn't know that. That's and so what happened was, he was rated uh, the most likely to recidivate, the most dangerous level of sex offender. Who level decides three. that? Who? A judge. The judge. And the judge decided on the basis that Yusuf Salam consistently refused to take responsibility for being a sex offender. He mm. continued to deny it to his family, to those close to him. When in prison, he refused to attend sex offender treatment because mm. you have mm. to first admit you're a sex offender in order mm. to get into sex. And since he refused to admit he was a sex offender and staunchly maintained his innocence, that meant yeah. he was yeah. among the most dangerous sex offenders. Is that or, yeah, or yeah. Maybe he didn't do it. Yeah, or maybe, right. But it's a big part of the criminal law, right? We, we want this sort of penitence, this repentance, this saying we're sorry, right? Is that a big part of the whole idea of the penitentiary, to be penitent? Well, that What's was, a, uh, the, the original idea, of course, behind the penitentiary was a, was a Quaker idea. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, uh, the idea was that if you lock people in a small room with nothing but a Bible, they will study their Bible. Think and about their... And reform them. Change of heart. But they, it turns out all they did was go insane. 
yeah. uh, with that. And so there was a m successive generations of enlightened penology that changed that. But it's but still we, the idea of penitence, though. That's but we, we actually don't focus enough on, on penitence and repentance and the sort of restorative kinds of justice. We focus right. in our system on punishment. Right. Retribution. And, and retribution and infliction of pain, and, and I mean, that's counterproductive for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. But for me, after watching this for, for 33 years, is that, that when you do that to people, they never get around to thinking about what it is they did that got them in this position because they feel so victimized themselves. Nor does society have to reflect on the conditions, the, the environment that they, that's been produced, the structural violence that people are living under. That's right. So we're all, you know, we avoid right. all of that. And, yeah. and if you had a, a, a correction system that actually encouraged people um, to reflect on, on the things that they did mm -hmm. uh, that got them in prison, uh, that wasn't focused around inflicting pain, and which did not over-criminalize millions and millions of people, uh, you'd have a much better system. Yeah, right? you use that word a lot, and you're right. You over-criminalize. We have an over-criminalized society, right? But we do. We do. And, and how much does the, the legal system, I know the answer already, uh, play in, in, in all of that? Uh, the legal system is what it's makes that that's what makes function. It, it's it that, that we we are its hands, its heart, its brains, its id, its liver, and its and spleen. Collecting funds from from it over and over. Right, and and I mean the 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 trouble with with over criminalization is is that the people who end up going through the system, they're not innocent in the sense that that. Um, they didn't do it. Yes, they possessed the drugs. Yes, they sold the drugs. Yes, they possessed uh, uh, the firearm. But, but they are disproportionately policed, so they are disproportionately arrested. Uh, their cases are handled in a much harsher way than, than uh, you know, middle-class white people who commit the same offenses. When you're defending somebody, do you, do you try to bring that out in the courtroom? With depending on the, what, the you, judge, by the time the jury. we get to a jury trial, yeah. there's no place. There's really not no much space for that. And 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 mm. look, I mean, I used to think I could radically, I could radically imagine. There we go. Yeah, that's see that's that? the, I, yeah. some radical I could radically there. imagine okay. a different <laughs> criminal justice system, and I would work to bring that about. That's yeah. how I started. Okay. These days, I'm just I just do harm reduction. Just, just view me as the legal equivalent of a needle exchange program. You know, and, I respect you very. I don't believe all yeah, of that. Yeah, well, by you the should. Um, if <laughs> I can get somebody uh, probation rather okay. than prison I time, yeah. if I can get them five years rather than ten, you'll take it. Uh, that's mostly what I do. If I can get this right. poor son of a bitch out of prison who's innocent, uh, I'll do that. If I can get a conviction overturned for constitutional violations, I'm just. Very happy at this point, uh, doing individual representation and, and hoping that enough of that individual representation will lead others to advocate for systemic change. And I, I, I was being flippant before. I, I think that's very important and, and uh, extremely important. That what you're dealing with is are, are human beings and you are doing a magnificent job every time you do that. But, but again, when we go back to more of the radical 60s and, and, and early 70s, when we were talking about systemic change, uh, structural change, do you see some of that occurring today? You've defended people, uh, uh, Operation Wall, uh, Occupy Wall Street, for example, Black Lives Matter. Do you see some of these people that you're, that you're you know, defending trying to do that? How does that well, feel I, when they're I, I, I you're do. talking with them? Yeah. I, I do, and, and there's certainly the movement to reform the criminal justice system, if you want to call so it a movement, is you're much a movement stronger lawyer. You now. still would call yourself a movement lawyer? When or there's a you? movement. When there's a movement. <laughs> All right, so that's what we're trying to do I here. I need a movement to All be right. a movement I lawyer. Get you, I get you. But, but and that's I what we're imagining here on this show. Radically and imagining, to, right. And we're trying but, to bring that about. But, 
know, and there are people like Reverend William Barber, who I mentioned to you before. Sure. Uh, and there are poor people yeah. throughout the legislatures in the various states right. and in Congress and in high places in the judicial system, as well as people out in the streets at the grassroots who, who are engaged in that activity. In the 1960s and 1970s, we, we spurned. Uh, electoral politics, or at least mm -hmm. I did. That was a tool of the bourgeoisie, you mm -hmm. know? If voting changed anything, it would be outlawed. Uh, smash the state. Uh, yeah. and, and that didn't Silly end stuff, some well. of that, right? Some yeah. of it was, was radically counterproductive. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I yeah. think that this generation that's active now and the generation that has mentored it, that remains active, uh, are, are much more strategic and I think much more effective, especially around criminal justice issues. Mm -hmm. uh, would they have accomplished what they've accomplished without a, a, a people's movement? I, I don't think so. But the, the two can work and do work together. It's just not as dramatic as it was in the 1960s. We did that already. That's been done. It's right. time to do other things and to do them in more effective ways. Occupy was, was delightful. And it was wonderful to see a, a friend of mine was saying, I've been waiting for these kids for 30 years. But where did that go? And, and the answer is without a structure, structure without a framework, organization, without yeah. a strategy, it really didn't go anywhere as a movement. Now, these are wonderful young people, and many of them went back to their communities and continued to work. When Hurricane Sandy hit yeah. in New York, Occupy Sandy. And you had people, yeah, we know how to, to, to generate power from a bicycle generator. We know how to get people's lights on and give them, and, and they did that at this very hands-on, almost social assistance level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's all wonderful, but in term, and, 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 and totally laudatory. But, but the Occupy movement as a movement for radical social change, for contesting public space. And, really and, and, <coughs> the, the ultimate levels of uh, levers of power may have raised some consciousness, uh, but again, to vie for economic and political power is another matter. It, it, it is. It indeed. is, and and so and it's a lot. It's a lot duller. Yeah, grinding you sort do of day by day. Petition campaigns yeah. and get people on ballots and get people. Sounds to like being a, a lawyer, doesn't it? No. I mean, well, no, I mean, no, I'm being paperwork. a lawyer at least. You I know, know, but you get out. And, and, and act, you're, you're <laughs> Not enough, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I'm trying to say here. It, uh, uh, you know, we talked a little before the, uh, the show about uh, the movement to draft uh, Bernie Sanders, a new po a people's uh, campaign, people party. Um, we've had Nick Braun and, and Cornel West have been behind this as well. Um, the hopes of, of putting a lot of the energy you're talking about into the necessary organization that can really compete electorally. The and argument our, is and, that, and that our Nick model, makes, yeah. Our model for doing that in the United States, yeah. for creating a viable third party that can actually yeah. get people elected is, is what? Well, Just Nick re should be here. My, my, well, my memory. Nick's argument was the Republican <coughs> Party. Uh, we'll, was we'll created what? from the Whig uh, Party, and, and that the majority of people in this country do believe and agree with a progressive agenda. So the idea is, do we, the, the strategy, they're going to have a conference September 8th to the 10th in Washington, D.C. Don't take your head yet. Oh, we're having a conference. Uh, a, a, a town meeting where, this, where there's going to be a, a, a decision as to continue possibly working within the party, Democratic Party pushing it more to its progressive roots, uh, or to set up a, a, a new party. Okay. Well. All right. Let's. But what other? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Donald go Trump ahead. is the president of the United States. By now, the way, I'm, I'm not I'm Curtis Lee right here, but right. we can get into it. Okay. I'm and I'm you. certainly not right. blaming Bernie Sanders for that. Right. Not at all. Bernie Sanders right. made it You're very right. clear right. from beginning to end okay. that we have to support Hillary and because we have to defeat Donald Trump. Now, a lot of his supporters mm. didn't get that. I, yeah. and, and the Bernie or bust crew, okay, we busted. How does it feel, folks? You wanna really do this again? Yeah. 
You really want to dis- well, What do you want to do again? What, what I, else I'm, is out there? I, I'm I, all about uh, conditions of struggle kind of guy. I don't know if you remember that from whatever party you used to belong to. We want to create the proper conditions for struggle. And those conditions are created when we are living in a liberal democracy that remains socially liberal and remains mm. responsive to some extent in criminal justice areas and other reform areas. The conditions of struggle for radical social change just don't occur when we're oh. living um, under somebody like Donald Trump. And anybody so who thinks we're differently- So talking about his resistance now. Right, and anybody That's who thinks differently yeah. is, is really mm. going by the Soviet playbook from the 1920s. And we okay. saw how that worked out. I mean, mm. it really is time to grow up and recognize that, that some very basic rights that belong to a lot of people are under sustained attack right now. Attacks on Understood. women, on reproductive rights, on immigrants, on Muslims. I mean, we'll give you the list. Mm -hmm. and, and for people to sit around and say, what we need is, is sort of ideological purity rather than spend time. I don't time think you're saying that. It's not either or. But I mean, I, I hear what well, you're Well, it becomes. It becomes either or because once you decide you're going to put your energy into some utterly spurious third party movement that has no chance of success, you are doing exactly what Chomsky said you shouldn't do. And what Chomsky said in, in the context of this electoral struggle, the one that just passed, right. I, I agree with. Um, other people's lives are more important than how you feel about yourself. I understand, but also, with all great due respect, Chomsky also tweeted a couple of days ago that, that Sanders might be the best option. Right, and, and so, look, he may very well be in, in retrospect, right. if we could look back. If he's going to be true to that, not waffle around but, anymore. But Bernie I got Sanders... You, right? Bernie Sanders could have been the best candidate the Democrats nominated. Uh, had he won the nomination, we now right. look back and say, gee, he might have won but, that election. But who really did him in on that? Well, I understand. It has it a was, variety, but, but certainly Hillary, but, but, by and large. Well, I mean, well, the Democratic, uh, Democratic Party did party. him in. Uh, a lot of other people who were sort of running his campaign as a protest campaign. But that, so what? Okay, so the, the, the DNC screwed Bernie Sanders over, and, and he, pro he might have been able to beat Donald Trump. Therefore, what? Therefore, what? Let's go out and form a People's Progressive Party and, and, ta and, and attack whatever Democrat from the left. That's well, what we really need to do. And you know whose trick that is? That's me. a Roger Stone trick. Uh -huh. Roger Stone has been doing this for decades, supporting mm. other left candidates. Sort of suicidal missions. Right, uh, more like homicidal Homo missions okay. against another progressive. Now, now look, a lot of, I'm not suggesting that the Bernie supporters are stone tools, right. so to speak. Yeah, uh, like. <laughs> but but okay. I, I think that when your choice is somebody who, like Hillary, with all of her problems and, and awfulness on one hand, uh, okay. or Donald Trump on the other, you know what? We wouldn't have Judge Gorsuch with Hillary Clinton. We would I not know. have William Beauregard Sessions III as the Attorney General of the United States, son. L let's, let's just examine for a brief time here. Someone else uh, on the, on the uh, political scene, Reverend William Barber, who um, is in the forefront of, a, of, of mobilizing, organizing a new poor people's campaign. Yes. Now, again, with president of NAACP, he has left that, so he is out there as the most charismatic, uh, profoundly moral leader that we've got out there. The closest thing that we have to Martin Luther King, that in terms of integrity, in terms of, right. this guy is not going to waffle. And, it, and he, he does in a way, it's not about Democrats, it's not about liberals, conservatives, it's about what's right mm -hmm. and wrong. A moral revolution, yep. if you will, um, of values. 
It's just simply wrong to cut 22 million people out of health care. People are going to die. It's not a matter of being liberal or Democrat. It's wrong. Now, what? It's it's is this the sort of radical transformation we need? As well in the law, does this need to be brought into the law? Putting someone behind bars in solitary confinement, maybe technically, yes, yeah, on, on the board, and it's a, it's on mm -hmm. the books. And this, is, God damn it, it's wrong. We don't do that. We shouldn't do that to people. Well, isn't well what? Well, okay. Well, first of all, I I, I think in terms of what we should be doing. No. We should all use whatever skills and privilege right. You're the skills that we have. And you have legal to, skills to, and to, ch to change the things we can change. So okay. it's not just lawyers or, or, or ministers, it's teachers right. and social workers and, and young people and artists and musicians. Uh, I mean, Therapists to, to and join, yeah, media exactly. And, uh, journalists uh, to, and so on. To sort of use what we have to oppose the, the most pernicious aspects of, of, of what's going on in this country today. Right. Uh, you know, in terms of, of radically changing the law using a it's just wrong philosophy, I mean, the, the trouble with that yeah. is there's a lot of other people who say well, exactly. the same thing. Exactly. And this and if you're going to act like a lawyer and function as a lawyer, you have to marry the idea of wrong to some sort of shared set of principles that we either agree on I'm fine, or yeah. at least have agreed on. So you can't simply say as a legal matter, health care is a right. Should be a right. I want it to be a right, okay. and there are ways we can make it a right. Okay. But but the idea that health care is some constitutional right is not going to win any arguments in a courtroom. You and have to not provide gonna, a you're basis. You're change the Constitution, as you say. And mm -hmm. I, I get it. I get it. And and the, the academic world has its role, as feeble as it is oftentimes, you know, producing the data, the empirical evidence that we could use, that could use in courts to push the agenda toward a more progressive viewpoint. Yes, and, okay. and the way we do that is, is through a legislative structure, which is wonky and boring and detailed. Uh, but, but once you start to insist that something is right or something is wrong, what is, the, what is the principle that indicates that outside of the fact I don't like this and I do like that? No, I get that. Okay. And then you could have absolute I mean, I'm not a big philosopher. I'm, I'm mostly no, a I trial understand. lawyer. But, well, no, but, well, yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, but but on the other point, the law is a moral declaration. It is an attempt to regulate behavior. And, and I think I know you'd agree that Generally speaking, throughout history, those with most power, economic, political power, have been able to call the shots, and the law is right a reflection of their interests. Now they have yeah. they're convinced that that's what it should be, right. and they've convinced most of the rest of us schmucks that is what should be. Well, I, you know, no? sure, I, I, it's, at its most basic level, the legal system is a reflection of the society that we live in. Exactly. Uh, on, a, on a less basic level, though, there's always, and, and the interesting thing about American constitutional law is that there are tensions that are created within the very system. So, for example, to take the First Amendment, we have an establishment clause saying you can't establish uh, a religion, and we have a free exercise clause saying you must allow people to freely exercise uh, uh, their religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a natural tension between right. those two principles. And, and where that tension plays out is, is the areas in which lawyers can really make a contribution. And this is true, yes, the state has all kinds of police power, but there are many, many procedural rights in the Bill of Rights that have to be vindicated. That have so to it's be compromises, checks and balances, yeah. and so on. And that and, and an incremental real, change right. toward a more civilized, humane way. Well, of I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm throwing where, in where we're making incremental this or that. I, I I do know that that the concept that this is all 
uh, 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 a bourgeois uh, degradation, and what we need to do is to destroy yeah. this system. I'm not going there. I, I th you, it you it just, I, I mean, whether I agree with that or not, <laughs> this ain't real. Uh, when I go into a courtroom to try to get some person out of prison, uh, it has to be through the legal system as I understand it, as I can persuade a judge or as I can persuade a jury. And uh, from that own personal experience of that person you're defending, right? Understanding oh that yeah. narrative. And that goes back to the that that early childhood that, that so you had, too. That so could be me. That there so you go. could be me. Right. The only difference is yeah. I didn't get caught. And mostly yeah. the reason I didn't get caught was I may have been poor, but you know yeah. what? Yeah. I was still white, yeah. and I still am. Yeah, I believe very, yeah, no, I, I know. very nice but, yeah, but yeah, you're white, yeah. you're a white guy. You're oh, and which <laughs> gets us into, we've got to understand why you've been called uh, in the, the cult, the cult uh, classic, Big Lebowski, you are the dude's lawyer. Right, right. Now, what, the, now, come on now. That's, the, the that's greatest 30 seconds I'm in all of history. That. Yeah. For those of you who, who in the audience who haven't watched the Everyone in our that's required uh, viewing. Okay. So everyone who's watching this now knows exactly what we're talking about. All right. About. You go to one but hour the one or two and 41 is, minutes. Okay. And, and, and not yeah. that I know it, but it, okay. if you go to one hour and 41 minutes, Malibu Police Station, great scene. I had no idea that was coming. I, I didn't. Yeah. I mean, the Cone brothers used to live on the Lower East Side uh -huh. around the time the consular and I were doing a lot of work around squatters and, and other things there. Uh, we had known them, kind of, but this was before they were the Cone brothers. <laughs> yeah. We were all just, you know, sort of people. And mm -hmm. so I ended up in that movie, and somebody told me about it like six months later. I didn't see it. But mm -hmm. uh, somebody said I'd gotten a shout out in this weird movie, The Big Lebowski, and mm. oh, that's cool. And I had no idea that that film would become the, the generational cult classic that it has, and most mm -hmm. of the way young people know me, uh, is you know, through the Big Lebowski. Oh, generation <laughs> after generation of adolescent boys know me <laughs> as the lawyer for the dude. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Hey, <laughs> listen, that's something to put on your tombstone. Uh, my, yeah, or, or, uh, right. or if you're going to be cremated, I, or uh, yeah. well, it's something right. that will we'll, we'll go down. No, I've that. already got my, uh, You've my got tombstone ready. Okay, right. And, and it's. Uh, Don't you want to know what it is? Well, go ahead. And is it going to be. Uh, where is it? Go where, are you, where are you going to be? I have no idea. I just buried. want the tombstone to have one sentence. It's okay. A question. Go ahead. Was it something that I said? Mm hmm. And in your case, it was, <laughs> yes, right? It will probably be, yes. <laughs> and, and you're not going to say, well, no, no, no restorative justice here uh, on the tombstone. Though it, it may take up too much. I'm sorry or nothing. Nope. No, I, I'm not sorry. Not sorry. Was it something that I said? Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, people are going to come in and vandalize it. Yes, it was, you, <laughs> you <laughs> so-and-so, you <laughs> I, fucking... I hope so. <laughs> yeah, well, let's... And <laughs> we're running out of time here, but... But speaking of, uh, I don't know what, death and, uh, and, and being buried. Now, up until recently, you were doing a show here. So, you know, with Curtis, Curtis Lewa, Lewa. Yes. So, yeah, radio talk radio. Two minutes we have. Radio talk radio. And here we are. I mean, God, you're, you're fabulous. What, what, what happened there? I got fired. Most, again. again. Most people say, but again? Again. But, but again, you were, you were in the media and you out there getting this wonderful perspective across and and they didn't like it what what, what well, was wrong they, what was you know the one thing about being fired in the media everybody knows this the reason they give you is yeah. never the actual reason well that's so what you said about the israelis too, they, right? they said it was budgetary <laughs> so i knew it wasn't budgetary uh, okay and, and you know what i don't i don't ask yeah. what the reason is because right. it doesn't matter the the truth is though um around the time of this election and right. dealing with uh, Trump supporters, it became, even before the election, increasingly difficult to have a conversation mm. with these people. And after you the election... You could tell, because you were on there for many yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. It was getting more and more what? Just, just, you, you, they weren't listening. They Counter just Counterfactual and irrational. Right, just crazy stuff. I, I used to, you know, we always would, it's Someday. a predominantly conservative station. I used to have right. arguments with people, but we usually could agree on a, a common set of facts. Right. And the question was the inferences to draw from those facts, and that's where we would disagree. Right, so, exactly. Okay, let's assume Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. 
Okay, this was during the Iraq War. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so, so does uh, Russia and a bunch of other countries. We're not bombing them. We can coexist. Yeah. And other people say, no, they're a danger. We have to attack them before they attack us. Right. But at least we could agree On factually. Right. Um, you know, or, or at least a hypothetical right. set of facts. But increasingly, the Trump supporters became more and more counterfactual. And after the election, it just went off the rails. So mm. they became so hard to talk to that I wasn't accomplishing anything here. The amount of energy and time it takes right. to try to convince the, this 30% of Trump's base that they're wrong, you know, you might as well go out and, and organize the people who aren't with this guy, the vast majority who are against him, organize them to go out and become active and to vote and to lobby and to, to do the things that need to be done. The Trump supporters, there's only one thing they have left to do for their country, there's die. Die, okay. Just die. And they're doing it. Remember, 80,000 white people in three yeah. states made the difference in this election, and happily, they are overdosing on oxy, they are committing <laughs> suicide, they are getting in driving while drunk, and dying of, of dietary preventable disease. There you go. Keep well, it up. Keep up. Listen. Crisis in the white community. Listen, Ron, Thank you, this Jim. has been absolutely <laughs> terrific. To life, not to death. We're going to wrap it up. This is Jim Vretto's. Welcome again to the Radical Imagination. We'll see you again next week. Thank you so much, Ron Thank you, Kubi, for being here. He's the dude's lawyer, and, and we just love you for it. Thank you again. Thanks. I know to you I may look old. Hope this statement ain't too bold, but here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge.